where you see the passing of time. We crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big baby salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. like these have been making history since the beginning of time. Banding together to do battle against a common enemy. For centuries, men have been leaving their homes and marching off to combat. Soldiers in the prime of life, joining their colleagues in arms for glory, God, country, or maybe just the spoils of war. For some, it was the highlight of their lives, a chance to leave the innocent days of youth behind and become a cog in a powerful, well-oiled machine. For others, it was a frightful introduction to the dark side of humanity, a test of their ability to endure the most harrowing of circumstances. The leaders of these vast legion of men are familiar household names. Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, Napoleon, and Robert E. Lee, whose successes and failures helped shape the history of the world. But while the generals and heads of state have always grabbed the lion's share of acclaim, the unsung heroes of warfare, the common foot soldier, have gone largely unrecognized. Yet, the men in the trenches are truly the lifeblood of every standing army. If not for the courage and ingenuity of the everyday foot soldier, no war would ever be won and no enemy vanquished. Who are these men who put their lives on the line every day when they go to the office? And what do they share in common with others who pursued a similar line of work? First and foremost, they were all dressed and armed for combat. Some needed elaborate suits of armor. Others traveled a little more lightly. And some hardly wore anything at all. No matter what you wore, every soldier in every conflict has been forced to march. And march. And march. We just keep walking and walking and walking. It comes with the territory. And anyone who complains, well, they don't have a foot to stand on. The Greeks, the Romans, even the barbarians. Hey, who are you calling a barbarian? Went to work the old fashioned way. They walked. To make matters worse, try marching 50 miles after camping out in some of the saddest, most pathetic conditions known to man. I'm talking dirt, mud, filth, lice. Lice? Oof. Martha Stewart would have to bring in her own army just to clean up the place. Then, of course, there was the food, if you can call it that. Throughout history, foot soldiers needed strong legs, strong backs, and even stronger stomachs. 
Half the time, they didn't know what they were eating, and that was a plus. You'd think that no one could survive this lifestyle, but survive it they did, by following the old adage, wine, women, and song. Oh, the carnage and bloodshed got you down? Have some booze, you'll be okay. Feeling lonely? Ah, don't worry. There's a simple cure for that. In every war, in every century, the men learned the best way to keep your sanity was to keep your sense of humor. And that's no joke. <laughs> In ancient Rome, soldiers found solace in the orgiastic splendor of the glorious empire. And who could blame them? In the medieval age, men discovered that a roll in the tent with a local camp follower was a surefire remedy for everything that ailed you. Gambling also provided a welcome relief from the hazards of war, even if it meant betting on the dreaded head lice who'd become your constant bedfellows. What motivates a person to become a foot soldier? Why choose to make a career out of fighting wars, when wars are a good way to get yourself killed? Hey, lad! To find out the answer to these and other pressing questions, we'll take a look back through history with a few bumpy detours, to march with the legions of Caesar, raid with the Vikings, conquer the world with Napoleon's men, and struggle with the doughboys in Europe. You'll even peer into the future and see the weapons of the next century. From the shadows of the pyramids, to the battlefield at Gettysburg, to the beaches at Normandy. One thing has always remained the same, the foot soldier. Johnny Reb, Billy Yank, G.I. Joe, fighting with dagger, sword, gun, or anything they could get their hands on. It is on the soldier's back that battles are won and victories achieved. The first stop on our adventurous march through history, the world's first great empire, ancient Egypt. 3,500 years ago, the place to be was ancient Egypt. Of course, it wasn't ancient then, it, it was modern day. <laughs> but as a foot soldier, you would look something like this, and you'd be fighting under the blistering rays of the sun without a drop of sunscreen. Now, if you fought bravely, there were rewards at the end of the day, like this bag of booty, or perhaps a slave or two. You might even get your own piece of land where you could build your dream house, a nice, comfortable tent. The Egyptians were the first of the ancient peoples to build a truly impressive civilization. We all know about the pyramids, sphinx, and mummies, but these folks were also artists, engineers, and warriors. For over 1,500 years, Egypt's history was lost. No one could read their hieroglyphic language. But with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone in 1798 and its subsequent decoding, the window into the Egyptian empire was opened. And what was it we found out? That the Egyptians had a record run at the top. Greece's empire ranked number one for about 500 years. Rome was a numero uno for about 600. Egypt's empire held the top spot for almost 3,000 years. And how do we know this? because all of their day-to-day -day activities were scrupulously recorded by the guys who wrote everything down, the scribes. There wasn't an arrowhead or a piece of grain that wasn't accounted for. It's no wonder the Egyptian civilization was the longest lasting in history. I will not make fun of the Pharaoh. I will not make fun of the Pharaoh. I will not make fun of the Pharaoh. Its life force, the Nile, extends more than 400 miles through the heart of the empire. Without the Nile, the country would have been barren. With it, the Egyptians inhabited one of the most richly endowed lands of the age. People worshipped several gods, but it was the pharaoh, in the form of a man who ran the country. He was the big kahuna, an absolute monarch who wore a number of different hats. He was the head priest, top bureaucrat, 
supreme military leader, and one heck of a party animal, too. During Egypt's early days, in what is referred to as the Old Kingdom, there was little need to embark on military expeditions. Egypt's geography provided her with a strong natural defense. Bounded to the east by the Sinai Desert and to the west by the Libyan Desert. So if you wanted to visit a buddy in Egypt, you'd best learn to walk like an Egyptian. Surrounded by an ocean of sand, the Egyptians lived isolated and secure, and had plenty of time for work projects, like cleaning out the garage, waxing the chariot, or putting up the pyramids. At Giza, 25 million tons of quarried limestone was transformed into three man-made mountains in just over a century. And right next door, they built the Sphinx, a giant half-man, half-lion, who, in 3,000 years, has yet to crack a smile. The Egyptians were also busy with trade expeditions and explorations which needed protection, and the foot soldier was just the guy to do it. Being a foot soldier in the Old Kingdom was a part-time gig with a good pillaging plan, and no previous experience was necessary. The uniform was pretty basic, no footwear, no body armor, just a macho skirt. By the Middle Kingdom, several touches had been added, including a headdress and sandals. The New Kingdom saw the arrival of a stylish wig, padded body armor, and my favorite innovation, a large oblong-shaped groin guard. Wonder why it took a thousand years to come up with this one. <laughs> It was during the Middle Kingdom, approximately 2040 to 1640 BC, that Egypt embarked on a program of military expansion into Nubia, now modern-day Sudan, which was rich with resources. So at once, the foot soldiers sprang into action. A chain of fortresses was set up along the Nile on the way to Nubia. The Egyptians' goal was twofold take control of the trade and traffic along the river, and to launch raids on the gold mines in Nubia. The forts were located at the most vulnerable points in the trade route, and served as both military outposts and custom stations. 50 to 300 men were stationed in each fort depending on its size. The buildings were built tough, almost invincible. Fortified gateways, watchtowers, Massive enclosed walls and ditches made them a triumph of military architecture. This model, discovered in an ancient Egyptian tomb, reveals a great deal about the foot soldiers of the day. They were simple, scantily clad, and wore stylish beetles haircuts. And by all indications, they kicked butt on the battlefield. In a similar tomb, a model of their arch enemies, Nubian archers, was discovered. Evidently, by 2700 BC, the Egyptians had not only defeated the Nubians, but had recruited them to reinforce the local troops. Nubians were very famous for their um, capability and techniques in shooting. This must have been the reason why the Egyptians tried at a very early stage to include Nubians in their army because they were excellent shooters. Although the Nubians were highly regarded as skilled warriors, the Egyptians didn't think too highly of them. The icon of the Nubian as the defeated enemy never lost its popularity as a symbol of Egyptian success. Even after the Nubian rulers inherited the Egyptian pharaoh's throne in the 7th century BC, the traditional motifs of the defeated Nubian were still depicted in the royal regalia. Egyptian expansion into Nubia created the image of a warrior. But what it didn't do was create the need for a full standing army. Egypt had yet to feel any foreign threats and still believed it was protected from the outside world. But then something happened which would dramatically rock the world of the foot soldier, the future of Egypt, and the history of warfare. Some bad boys from the north rolled into town. 
By the end of the Middle Kingdom, the 17th century BC, Egypt was ruled by a foreign power. These mean hombres rode into town on chariots, something the Egyptians had yet to develop. The pharaohs had been so busy building monuments to themselves, they failed to keep up with the Joneses. As a result, their weapons remained virtually unchanged for almost 700 years. The painful truth was that the Egyptians had become a bunch of slackers. Around 1640 BC, Egypt received an abrupt lesson in the dangers of letting its armies sit around idly for centuries. A powerful Asiatic group swept down from the north and seized the Egyptian throne. Their names? The Hyksos. The Hyksosts burst upon the scene in their horse-drawn chariots and introduced a weapon far more powerful than anything carried by the Egyptian infantry, the composite-eyed bow. So really, what one had was a situation where people who were not clearly as civilized as the Egyptians, but had access to superior military technology, came in and took advantage of weakness, and using the superior military technology, were able to impose their power. Egypt was now suffering its greatest indignity. To the conservative Egyptian, the Hyksos were nothing more than a bunch of, well, Hicks. And here they were, as bearded masters, disrespecting the Egyptian gods, dressing like delinquent bikers, and calling all the shots. Fortunately, there was an upside. The Egyptians were very observant and knew a good idea when they saw one. They began to copy the Hyksos military designs and learned to build the very same weapons and chariots that had been used to defeat them. After more than 150 years of domination, the Egyptians fought back. A patriotic fervor spread throughout the land. Around 1540 BC, the Egyptians rose up against their oppressors. After over 10 years of fighting, Pharaoh Amos finally drove out the Hyksos rulers. The bearded foreigners would no longer be running the show. The Egyptians were again masters of their own domain. Well, this is a great example of the new kingdom foot soldier. He's a little stiff, but you know, he's a lot of fun at parties. As you can see, he still doesn't have a lot to wear. But now, he's driven to succeed. Each time he slew an enemy, gold would be his reward. And to prove his claim, he'd bring home the hands of those he killed. Just like, oh, look, he brought one home, okay. <laughs> you know, on occasion, just to prove his prowess, he'd even bring home their private parts. I think he used a different bag for that. The hands were collected and placed in a hand basket, no pun intended, and then counted by the scribes. Now, if they weren't good at arithmetic, no problem. They had plenty of fingers to count with. Amos's victory over the Hyksos launched Egypt into a new kingdom, which lasted almost 500 years, from 1550 BC to 1070 BC. It was an era of expansion and conquest here in the place known to Hollywood filmmakers as the land of the pharaohs. The Egyptians now had a one-track mind. Well, maybe two tracks. They wanted to make love and war, and knew that in order to do so, they needed to build an army so strong they would never be caught with their pants down again. During the war, of course. They decided to expand into Syria, Palestine to provide a buffer zone along their northeastern border. And they continued to modernize their weapons. The Egyptians were especially adept at building chariots. Soon, they were rolling off the assembly line like Fords out of Detroit. These hot rods were especially valued by the military. In fact, over the next 2,000 years, chariots were the Cadillacs of the battlefield, if you knew how to drive them. But not every Egyptian foot soldier joined up by choice. Some boys, as young as 12, were conscripted and had to go. An ancient scribe made note of the harsh treatment often inflicted in training. Come, I will describe to you the lot of the infantryman, the much exerted one. He is brought as a child and confined to a barrack. 
A painful blow is dealt to his body. A savage blow to his eye. Thank you, sir. May I have another? And a splitting blow to his brow. Thank you, sir. May I have another? His head is split open with a wound. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Papyrus Anastasi III. There is a distinct sense that, 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 that compared with, say, the Assyrians or the, or the Babylonians, the Egyptians um, were, in general, a, a rather more peace-loving, pacifist kind of population. So we can tell from accounts of the training of these conscripted soldiers that, to a large extent, they were having to be moulded into an aggressive fighting force. Despite the hardships of a soldier's life abroad, it must have been exciting for Egyptians to go out on the campaign. They got to travel and see the world. But try not to get yourself killed on the road. According to religious belief, every Egyptian needed to be buried in his homeland in order to experience an afterlife. We know from sources of the New Kingdom again, that on quarry expeditions, embalmers and priests were also included. They prepared the bodies of dead persons, also in order to carry them back to Egypt after the expedition. Mummification was an important part of the burial process for kings and commoners alike. Died in the desert? Fried in a foreign land? Fear not. At Sandy Meadows, we guarantee a safe, peaceful journey to eternity. Our embalmers use the finest linens, bandages, and wrappings. Our masks are golden. Our sarcophagi to die for. Death can be such a difficult time. Why leave immortality to chance? At Sandy Meadows, your future is in our hands. Call now, and we'll mummify your favorite pet for free. Certainly no self-respecting foot soldier was eager to end up as a mummy. To protect himself, he used an assortment of weapons, including a spear, a little axe, a shield, um, no and a big axe. For the poor, uneducated Egyptian foot soldier, the new and improved professional army provided an opportunity to move up in life. The average length of service in the Egyptian army seems to have been um, as high as 20 years. It suggests that uh, many individuals might have spent their entire life in the Egyptian army. By this time, there was a complete military hierarchy. At the lowest rung was the foot soldier, Middle command included squad leaders, platoon leaders, and commanders. At the top of this pyramid stood the big guy, the pharaoh. All told, the Egyptian army numbered more than 10,000 men. Egypt was now ready to go into battle and pursue its imperial dreams. And it had its leader to do that, Tutmosis III. Tutmosis III was the triumphant pharaoh who set the Egyptian empire on a firm foundation for almost a century. He's considered the Napoleon of ancient Egypt, short in stature with a taste for conquering others. Tutmosis was the consummate leader. Under his guidance, the army prospered. He was personally responsible for most of the reforms that allowed the military to achieve such great success. By the time, certainly, of Tutmosis III, there is a professional core in the army of long-term serving soldiers. Now, by that time, uh, the army had emerged as a means whereby even quite lowly born young men could enter the army and make a career for themselves. For 20 years, Tutmosis led his men into Asia almost every year. His first military objective was Megiddo a rich and powerful city-state of the Mitanni Kingdom. The battle at Megiddo was the earliest in human history of which a detailed account exists. In the spring of 1468 BC, Tutmosis III told the boys, pack your lunches, we're going for a little hike. 
He lied. Yes, he lied. Stop complaining and keep walking. They were on their way to Megiddo, some 150 miles away. Nine days later, Tutmosis and his forces reached their base in Gaza, having covered some 15 miles a day through the Sinai. 15 miles a day, fully loaded in the scalding desert. No compass, no water-resistant hiking boots, no sport utility vehicles, and no global positioning satellite. Just a lot of schlepping. The relatively few sources that describe the life of a foot soldier uh, make it sound pretty unpleasant. And one is given the impression that uh, they have to carry most of their equipment with them and they have to carry their rations with them, and that basically it's not very appetizing. Not appetizing? Ancient records reveal that bread and foul-tasting water were typically carried on such journeys. Sounds worse than airplane food to me. If the soldiers were lucky, cattle were brought along or seized from villagers along the way. We do know that, for example, the average calorie intake for a soldier in the sorts of temperatures we're talking about was in a region of about 3,500 calories per day. Whew, that sounds like a lot of calories to me. And we know they weren't eating ice cream sundaes, so where were these calories coming from? Models have been found in ancient tombs which show bread being made. Other models depict Egyptian party animals brewing an original, nutritious beer. Boy, could have used friends like these back in college. Probably nobody would like nowadays to drink Egyptian beer. <laughs> It was made of bread soaked in water, and then they put certain ferments into it. Alcoholic. Uh, it's, it's alcoholic. But Egyptian beer must have been sweet and very nourishing. With their stomachs full and their heads buzzing, Tutmosis and his men flexed their military muscles and sacked a handful of towns on their way to Megiddo. According to legend, as the army advanced, Tutmosis sent some of his men to the town of Joppa, today a port city located in Israel. There, they came up with an ingenious plan to lay siege to the town. The soldiers during the reign of King Tutmosis were smuggled into Joppa inside baskets like this. This is, this is actually bigger than my first apartment in New York. <laughs> Imagine trying to pick one of these up. Can you say hernia? These, my friend, are what's known as the picnic baskets from hell. As the story goes, 200 soldiers were smuggled into Joppa inside 200 baskets. Sound familiar? This was the Trojan horse, only with no Trojans and no horse. Just a bunch of clever Egyptians who managed to conquer the town. There were three possible routes into Megiddo. Tutmosis outsmarted the enemy by taking the least likely path, a narrow pass just 30 feet at its widest, they had to go single file, horse behind horse, with the chariots carried on the shoulders of the foot soldiers. They set up camp and tried to get a good night's sleep, knowing the following morning they would go into battle. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, the Egyptian army marched in full uniform, horse plumes and flags held aloft, drums pounding out an intimidating war beat. What a sight! The chariots charged first, and the enemy panicked. They retreated into Megiddo's walled city, leaving behind their weapons, chariots, and horses. So far, so good for the foot soldiers, but with so many goodies lying about, they went booty crazy. They forgot their goal was to take control of the city. They lost momentum, and it took a seven-month siege before Megiddo fell. The attraction of the booty was just a little bit probably too much for them. Clearly, it was immensely rich, because when Megiddo finally did fall, the uh, actual booty taken from within the city was fairly substantial. So they went shopping for some very rich pickings, I think. The booty included 1,796 slaves, 83 hands, 2,041 horses, not to mention various chariots, cows, goats, sheep, gold, household goods, and whatever else they could get their hands on. Tutmosis III redrew the map of the ancient Near East. 
the Egyptian empire was now at its largest, encompassing almost 400,000 square miles, stretching from the Euphrates in the north to the desert of Nubia in the south. Under Tutmosis, the new image of the military man was formed. Kings were now presented as battle heroes, a new military class developed, and soldiers began receiving attractive parcels of land and appointments to higher positions. The empire was at its height of power and glory. International war brought wealth into Egypt. 200 years later, Tutmosis' achievements spurred the ambitions of a young pharaoh, Ramses II. His ambition, success, and military genius would earn him the title Ramses the Great. All right, sports fans, let's run through some highlights. We're early in the third quarter of Egypt's 3,000-year reign. The first quarter, the Old Kingdom, had been big. The country was unified, the pyramids were built. Yay! And the mummies, they're still looking like new. The second quarter, the Middle Kingdom, had been a different story. The boys had gotten soft. The opponents had done some damage, and the home team had lost its momentum. It's going to take a big second half to regain the lead. And Ramses II was just the guy to lead the charge. Ramses. When Ramses II began his rule in 1290 BC, there was trouble. Egypt's aggressiveness and self-confidence was diminishing. Its golden age was coming to an end. Maybe it was the disruptive religious beliefs of a former pharaoh who'd wanted the people to worship one god instead of many. Maybe it was the incursions made by an outside power. Or maybe that relentless beating sun had just left the people burnt out. Ramses had a burning desire to restore his empire's borders. He called upon his loyal army and headed to the Syria-Palestine this time to fight the advancing Hittites. The decided place for the battle was Kadesh, the bone of contention between the two empires. The bad guys, the Hittites, were from the land now known as Turkey. They moved southwest into Syria and Palestine. Ramses II called them women soldiers because of their long hair, which required a fair amount of attention. But don't get me wrong, their hair was fluff, but they were buff. The Hittite's three-man chariot was the Rolls-Royce of fighting machines. Sturdy and built to last, it came with a lifetime guarantee and carried three men, a shield-bearer, a spearman, and a driver. The good guys, our beloved Egyptians, preferred a light two-man vehicle bearing just a driver and a warrior. It came equipped with arrows and javelins for long-range fighting. It was the summer of 1285 BC. A professional army of 20,000 assembled, made up of career soldiers, peasant conscripts, and an increasing number of foreign mercenaries. Mercenaries, particularly prisoners of war, were often retained and incorporated into specific forces in the Egyptian army. Come on, you're a prisoner of war. What are you going to do, say no? It became particularly common for, for instance, um, people who were captured in, in the um, campaigns in, in Palestine to be integrated into the Egyptian army and then uh, sent out to campaign sometimes against the, the people who they themselves had once lived with. Among the foreigners who signed on with the Egyptian army were the Sherdans. Some of the scenes of the Battle of Kadesh show troops uh, known as the Shardana. And these were uh, mercenary troops. They have very distinctive horned helmets, and they carry very sharp stabbing swords. And they have a, also a very characteristic round shield. And they become very important in the Ramesid army, along with various other groups. The mercenaries who fought for the Egyptian army were fully integrated into Egyptian life. It was not unusual for a foreign mercenary to find himself a nice Egyptian girl, settle down, and raise a family together. 
Ramses divided his army into two forces for the long trek north. He led the main force. The soldiers marched through rugged terrain and cold weather, which they had never experienced in their life. This was not a trek for the faint of heart. The men had to climb barefoot over rugged mountains, dragging their chariots in tow. The arduous trek left them battered and bruised. Anyone who chose to run in the opposite direction was well aware of the consequences. Punishment for desertion was putting the family to jail. This is what we know, and of course, they were also pursued. Deserters were pursued, and when they were brought back, it was probably not nice what happened to them. So there weren't too many options but to forge on. Ramses II set up camp across the river from Kadesh. This war was the most thoroughly documented of ancient Egypt. The camp was a rectangular compound. You've heard of four stars? Well, this was for the birds. In fact, animals and soldiers were treated about the same. When they got to the camp, the horses, donkeys, oxen, and men were all watered and fed. Sounds like a real animal house to me. It seems to be surrounded by a large enclosure wall built up of shields and then has the, the royal sort of tent in the middle of it. Um, this seems to be a fairly large and impressive structure. Now, exactly what the accommodation provided for ordinary troops was like, we have very little evidence. But we do know that the pharaoh's lion got his own tent. Talk about animal rights. The key to the battle was the fact that Ramses II fell for one of the oldest tricks in the book. But, of course, back then, the book wasn't that old. Two men, who turned out to be spies, told him the king of the Hittites was so intimidated by his prowess that he decided not to fight. That's the sort of information you'd probably want to verify. But what did Ramses do? He sat there stone-faced. So guess what? Yep. Hittites were just across the river from the Egyptian camp, just waiting for the right moment to attack. Maybe when Ramses was, uh, in an important military meeting? <laughs> now to make a long battle short. One of the Egyptian divisions, which was not with Ramses, was unexpectedly attacked by the Hittites in the wee hours of the morning. Needless to say, the poor guys didn't stand a chance. Most of them were speared or pummeled to death. A fortunate few ran for their lives. The Hittite chariots continued on to Ramses' camp, where one of the history's great chariot battles played out. Ramses mounted his chariot, and with the assistance of only his immediate entourage, attacked the enemy. The Egyptians, with their peppy little two-seaters, ran circles around the Hittites in their big, cumbersome luxury sedans. Egyptians were able to play around just long enough for reinforcements to show up. The battle ended basically in a draw, although the boastful Ramses II claimed victory. Did Ramses give his army or foot soldiers any recognition? No. In fact, he accused them of abandoning him and took full credit for the conquest. Talk about being two-faced. The first peace treaty in mankind was chiseled up. Guess what Ramses got? A beautiful Hittite princess. And both empires settled down to a peaceful coexistence. Just how the marriage turned out, we don't know. But we do know Ramses had more than 100 children. So we can assume they probably got along OK. Ramsey's military and social success was matched only by his tremendous ego. He issued orders to scratch out the names of the previous pharaohs which adorned the temples and monuments throughout Egypt and then replaced their names with his own. More buildings and statues were built to honor Ramses than any other pharaoh, including the temple of Abu Simbel, which stands over 65 feet high. Twice a year, the rising sun shines its rays through the sanctuary doors. 
down a long hallway, and onto the statues of Ramses seated with the gods. That, my friends, is one colossal ego. After Ramses II's death, Egypt entered a period of slow but steady decline. With its army and its power disintegrating, she would be called to fight another major battle, this time on land and at sea. Almost a hundred years after Ramses II fought the great battle of Kadesh, another Ramses appeared on the scene, Ramses III. Able and energetic, he turned out to be the last of the warrior pharaohs. But under his rule, the Egyptian empire began to disintegrate. Land was lost in Canaan, Levant, and the entire Near East. The invading forces, dispossessed nations known as the Sea People, attacked Egypt from the west and north. These people clearly came for keeps, as they brought along their families, cattle, and household possessions. The straw that broke the camel's back occurred in the eighth year of Ramses III. It was 1193 BC. The Sea People had advanced on Egypt by land and water. Egypt's last great war was at hand. At this point, the Egyptian infantry looked like the parade of nations during the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. Almost half the soldiers were foreigners, or you might say, out of towners. There were the Nubians, the skilled archers, the Libyans, who wore feathers on their head and had a lilt in their step, and the Sherdens, still wearing their distinctive horned helmets. As a spectator, you needed a program to know who was fighting for whom. One of the problems Ramses III had with this particular war is obvious by the name of the enemy, the Sea People. Yes, Egypt was asked to wage a naval war, something they had never done before. The naval battle took place near the coast, close to the Nile Delta. The Egyptian force consisted both of warships and infantry stationed along the shore. Sea people are the guys in the feather-topped helmets with long spears and round shields. You probably recognize those horned helmets. Those are the Sheridans, seen here in boats, allied with the sea people. Sheridan mercenaries also fought with the Pharaoh's troops. Can you imagine suddenly meeting your brother in battle? You could call that the ultimate family feud. Interesting is a characteristic of all imperial powers that they've tended to recruit soldiers who actually fought against them to use against their own peoples. Now, back to the war. Now, even though the Egyptians did not have a full-time navy, its army was well prepared to fight at sea. Ramses set up a defense which was impossible to penetrate. Warships, galleys, and skiffs were filled to capacity with his best warriors, itching for a fight. Not only did Ramses round up the creme de la creme to fight this war, he also had far superior warships. The Egyptian ships were powered both by sails and oars. The Sea People ships were powered only by sails. Without a good wind, the Sea People weren't going anywhere, and for the Egyptians, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Ramses' seaborne chariots had transported groups of oarsmen, archers, and foot soldiers out to sea and they were ready for action. The Egyptian fleet followed the ships of the Sea People into the river mouths of the Delta. The Egyptians then encircled the enemy while releasing hails of arrows. Trapped between a rock and a wet place, the Sea People, otherwise known as sitting ducks, were fresh meat for the macho Egyptians waiting on the shore. Close enough to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the eager Egyptian infantry attacked. The Sea People were butchered without mercy. Ramses himself wrote of the conflict. They were dragged in, enclosed, and prostrated on the beach, killed and made into heaps from tail to head. Their ships and their goods were as if fallen into the water. Despite the overwhelming victories claimed by Ramses III, the invaders were still able to settle in the coastal towns of Palestine, and the Egyptians could do nothing about it testimony to the decline in Egypt's power and influence. A fiction was maintained that Egyptian power still extended 
to Palestine. In reality, Egypt had lost its empire in Canaan and Syria and had withdrawn to the borders of the kingdom. So it was back to where it started before the Hyksos invasion. The Egyptian treasury had been drained by extensive building projects and the army. The central government eventually became so weak, Egypt split up into small states. Libyan and Nubian mercenaries who had risen to prominence started inheriting the throne. About 700 BC, Ethiopian invaders entered Egypt. After the Ethiopians came, the Assyrians, then the Persians, and finally, Alexander the Great, who invaded Egypt and became the new pharaoh in 332 BC. The great Egyptian empire now ceased to exist. With it went the foot soldier. All that remains today are the great monuments and reliefs testimonies to the wars for which the Egyptian foot soldier not only risked his life, but in some cases gave it. Oh boy, well, <laughs> more than 2,500 years have passed since the Egyptian army first marched through the sandy deserts of the Middle East. But the lessons of that day are now as relevant as ever. A military force must be organized, well-equipped, and capable of changing with the times. And even if you don't have CNN breathing down your neck, you still have to win your war. The main component, the foot soldier, must be skilled, disciplined, and move quicker than this big fella. <laughs> For it was the brave, unwavering Egyptian foot soldiers who provided the pharaohs with the means to build an empire.